Okay, so before we start today, uh, there is an announcement on the screen here. Uh, Professor J.C. Price, one of our biochemists, uh, has informed me that he has many undergrads graduating this year, so he's looking for new undergrads to join his lab. Uh, I'm hopeful that most of you are involved in research already. If not, then you should get involved. Uh, if you're looking for uh, a research opportunity, uh, please contact uh, J.C. Price if any of these topics seem interesting to you. Uh, he uses uh, mass spectrometry as a tool for studying uh, biological systems. Uh, he generates very, very large data sets, so it's related to bioinformatics, proteomics, a lot of popular buzzwords these days. So uh, if you're interested in that, please contact uh, Professor Price. Uh, and then a reminder that our synthesis assignment is due on Monday, so please make sure you bring that. It's due in class. Please, please bring it to class and turn it in. Today we will be concluding our discussion of uh, proteins, and uh, then we will start our discussion of carbohydrates. Uh, we'll talk about various types of carbohydrates, uh, classes. Uh, we'll focus on their stereochemistry. Stereochemistry is a critical aspect of carbohydrate chemistry. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, the conformations they exist in in nature, which is the cyclic uh, hemiacetal. But first, uh, back to proteins. So this figure here summarizes very nicely what we talked about at the end of class on Wednesday, the four levels of protein structure from primary to quaternary. Okay, so... If you have any questions uh, about this, then just go back to the specific discussions of these types of structures from Wednesday's lecture. Um, we can classify proteins into two different categories according to their structure and their solubility properties. Uh, the first one we'll talk about today is fibrous proteins. As the name suggests, they form fibers. Uh, these fibers are insoluble in water. Uh, and so as a result, fibrous proteins tend to perform structural functions in nature. Uh, an example of a fibrous protein is alpha keratin. Alpha keratin is made up of alpha helices, and these alpha helices are rich in alanine and leucine. If you remember the, the, the three-dimensional structure of the alpha helix, those side chains are pointing off the sides of those helices. That's what's going to be exposed on the surface of the helix. Uh, and so it's definitely not going to be soluble in water uh, because it's only a hydrocarbon side chain. Uh, alpha keratin makes up many different structures in nature, uh, many different tissues, I should say, hair, fingernails, hooves for those animals that have them, uh, as well as wool, those, those, those uh, materials are largely alpha keratin, okay? Uh, rhinoceros horn also. Rhinoceros horn is prized in many different cultures for various types of medicinal properties. It's essentially made out of the same thing as your hair and your toenails. So uh, I don't really put a lot of credence in those uh, medicinal properties, supposed medicinal properties of rhinoceros horn. So um, those alpha helices in alpha keratin will associate with each other. Two alpha helices will wind around each other to form what's known as a supercoil. How are those alpha helices going to associate with each other? What kinds of interactions will they have? Think about the side chains that are involved. What's that? Okay, London dispersion or van der Waals forces, correct? Okay, so they'll be held together by, by van der Waals type forces. Uh, and then this supercoil, uh, supercoils themselves are going to associate into larger bundles, again, using primarily van der Waals forces, uh, and, and that will form a single strand of hair. So a single strand of hair will have lots of these supercoils in it, okay? Uh, now, this is not the whole story because alpha keratin will also have some cysteines present, and we know that cysteines can form disulfide bonds with another cysteine. Uh, and so our hair strands have these disulfide bonds that hold the hair in the shape that it has. So has anybody in the class ever gotten a perm before? 
If you've gotten a perm and you're willing to admit it, please raise your hand. Okay, good, Minnie's had a perm. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the chemistry involved in getting a perm. So in your straight hair, most of us have straight hair. If you have naturally curly hair, you can get it straightened actually uh, using a same, similar process. When you get a perm, the stylist will treat your hair with a solution. That solution has reducing agents in it that will reduce the disulfide bonds. Okay, we've learned this in class in a couple scenarios where you can reduce a disulfide to give the uh, two equivalents of the thiol. Okay, so that uh, breaks up some of the structure in your hair strands. Uh, and then the stylist will use curling irons or curlers, some combination of those, to mold your hair into the shape that you want. Okay, uh, and as the hair is molded into that shape, that's going to put different, so different cysteines in close proximity to each other. Uh, and then the stylist will apply a second solution, which has an oxidizing agent uh, that is now going to form. It really shouldn't say reform the disulfide bonds. It should say form new disulfide bonds because you're going to have different sulfurs close to each other. And you're going to have a different set of disulfide bonds. And that's what's going to cause your hair to hold in that curled state. So that's why it's called a perm or a permanent, because you formed those disulfide bonds uh, to, to, to hold the hair in the curly shape. Okay, questions? So this is good information to have if, if you ever want to make conversation with a hairstylist. Uh, I found that they uh, tend to get very happy when you acknowledge that they actually had to learn chemistry in beauty school. Right? Beauty school has kind of an unfair uh, image or stereotype associated with it, but hairstylists actually have to learn a fair amount of chemistry uh, in order to uh, work. Uh, and so if you tell them about, you understand the chemistry of a perm, uh, usually they like that and you get good service. Uh, in fact, um, one year when I taught this lecture, I had a student who sent me an email and said that he had just gone on a date with a hairstylist and he was able to impress her with his uh, knowledge of perm chemistry. Uh, I don't know how it turned out in the long term, but in the short term, uh, he, he was pretty happy with, uh, with how that knowledge uh, impressed his uh, date. So lots of different ways you can use the knowledge you gain in this class. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so maybe, I, I don't know the answer, but just off the top of my head, I'd say that it could just relate to maybe uh, subtle differences in the sequence of the keratin so that the cysteines might be in different locations, but, but that's just speculation, so. All right, um, so there's another type of fibrous protein that forms a unique type of helix, and that is known as collagen. Uh, so collagen, is rich in proline and glycine. And I told you that proline is not found in alpha helices, uh, which is true, uh, but you can find proline in these special collagen types of helices, which actually have a left-handed twist, a counterclockwise twist to them. Uh, so if you have proline and glycine, uh, you can get this opposite left-handed helix called a collagen helix that likes to associate with three of these helices coming together via hydrogen bonding, going across the strands, okay? So it's a unique triple helical structure. Collagen, being a fibrous protein, also has structural roles in nature. Does anybody know what collagen is used for in nature or where it is found? What sorts of tissues it's found in? Any idea? Skin, okay. Uh, yes, are you raising your hand? Maybe not. Uh, connective tissues as well, so your cartilage will have a lot of collagen in it. Uh, bone can have some collagen in it. So, um, so it forms these uh, unique kinds of fibers uh, due to this unique sort of triple helix. All right, and then our second class of proteins we'll talk about are the globular proteins. So fibrous proteins are elongated and form fibers. Globular proteins, as the name suggests, are much more compact. Uh, and they're going to be water soluble. Uh, and since most of the chemistry in our body takes place in water, that's going to allow globular proteins uh, to do a wider range of things than fibrous proteins. They're going to be, in, uh, most enzymes are going to be globular proteins. 
Uh, and then transport proteins, proteins that transport various species around uh, the body would also be uh, globular proteins. So uh, many globular proteins uh, are also known as conjugated proteins. So conjugated proteins are proteins that have a, a protein and a non-protein component to them. And the non-protein component is covalently bonded to the protein. And that is referred to as a prosthetic group. So conjugated proteins will have prosthetic groups that are usually involved in the chemistry that the, the protein is performing. One of the most common and prominent prosthetic groups is the heme group. Heme is shown right here. It has uh, four nitrogen heterocycles arranged in this macrocyclic structure. So we have a Lewis basic cavity that allows a Lewis acidic iron dication to bond, to, to associate in there by Lewis acid, Lewis base interactions. Uh, and then here we have our ion dipole interactions. Uh, and then we have these carboxylic acids coming off the side, uh, which will allow it to uh, covalently bond to the protein, uh, usually through amides that are formed with lysine side chains. Okay? So what is heme used for in nature? Blood, yes. Uh, any, uh, what is its role in blood? Carries oxygen. This iron cation is very good at binding an oxygen molecule. And so heme is present in proteins, such as hemoglobin, that transports oxygen throughout the body, or myoglobin, which is a protein that stores oxygen uh, at various, uh, in various tissues, okay? So it's kind of hard to see. This is the best diagram I have, not a great one. Uh, this shows myoglobin. Myoglobin has about 150 amino acids in it. Um, and you see it has a lot of helices. These helices form this cleft or cavity where the heme prosthetic group is held in myoglobin. Uh, and then your oxygen is just going to be bonded or associated to that iron in the middle. Okay, So myoglobin is a storage protein. Uh, oxygen is stored in myoglobin in various tissues. Uh, whales have tons of myoglobin. A whale will surface briefly, inhale a bunch of air. The oxygen in that air is transported to the myoglobin in various tissues. And then the whale can go back below the surface uh, and it can survive because it uh, has all this myoglobin. Okay, um, and then of course there's hemoglobin, which you are presumably familiar with. Uh, hemoglobin is a tetramer. It has quaternary structure. So it has four different protein chains. It has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Okay, so, and they're each about as long as myoglobin. So you have about, hemoglobin's very big, uh, has, has uh, close to 600 amino acids in it. Uh, and so uh, it has the uh, two of each of these subunits associating together. Now, because globular proteins are water soluble, most of the amino acids on the surface of the protein are going to have polar side chains that would allow that, that uh, protein to dissolve in water. But the alpha and beta subunits of hemoglobin have these nonpolar patches on the surface. And the purpose of those nonpolar patches is to allow those subunits to come together and associate with each other via van der Waals forces. Okay? So the quaternary structure of hemoglobin is largely due to van der Waals forces uh, holding those subunits together at those nonpolar patches. Okay? Questions? Yes. That's a good question. So they are formed, uh, protein synthesis occurs on the ribosome. And I would imagine that the alpha and beta subunits are probably formed in similar areas of the ribosome. Uh, once the chain is, is formed, so folding uh, 150 residue protein into its folded shape is going to be tough. And so you have other enzymes called chaperones that help in that folding process. 
And so presumably once they're folded, uh, then they'll be in close enough proximity that they can associate. But I, I don't know the exact answer to that. So with hemoglobin, uh, well, before we get into that, one more thing. So we know that hemoglobin or heme itself binds oxygen, uh, uh, and, th and that's the purpose of it, to transport oxygen and store oxygen. Does anybody know why carbon monoxide is so toxic? Yes. Yes, carbon monoxide bonds more strongly to heme than oxygen does. And so if you inhale carbon monoxide, it will displace the oxygen from your heme in your hemoglobin and myoglobin. And so it will asphyxiate your body uh, because you will no longer be able to get oxygen to the places that it is needed. Right? So that's why we have to be very careful to avoid exposure to carbon monoxide. All right, now um, there's a disease associated with hemoglobin known as sickle cell anemia. And here we have a photo of red blood cells, normal red blood cells, and a sickle cell. The, the, you can see where the name of the disease comes from. This disease is caused by a single mutation in, I believe it's the beta chain. Let me just look in my notes here. Yeah, so the beta, the beta subunit, a glutamic acid in the beta subunit of hemoglobin gets mutated to a valine. So that's one change out of more than 100 amino acids. Can't be a big problem, right? Well, it's a substantial change. You're changing a, a charged side chain. That carboxylate is going to be negatively charged at uh, physiological pH. You're changing that into a nonpolar side chain. So it has a dramatic impact on the shape of the hemoglobin. You get misshapen hemoglobin, which causes you to have misshapen red blood cells. Uh, and so the red blood cells don't flow through the, the blood vessels properly. They get caught, and that causes a tremendous amount of pain for people who have sickle cell anemia. Usually they die um, uh, at least uh, in their 40s, if not sooner. Okay, so a very painful disease. Questions? All right, so that uh, concludes our discussion of peptides and proteins. Let's shift gears and talk about carbohydrates. So we have an introductory figure here. Let's go back. There we go. That shows us some carbohydrates. So the name carbohydrates refers to the structure or the molecular formula of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates have this uh, same uh, generic molecular formula, uh, and thus they were considered to be hydrated forms of carbon. Uh, now uh, we know that they are polyhydroxylated aldehydes and ketones. Carbohydrates are going to have tons of OH groups. They're going to have uh, either an aldehyde or a ketone, although sometimes we don't see the aldehyde or a ketone. Sometimes it's disguised uh, as a hemiacetal. What are carbohydrates used for in nature? They're used for energy, right? You think of carbohydrates, you think of energy. Okay, so they're biosynthesized uh, using photosynthesis, and then they're metabolized. We'll talk a little bit at the uh, end of the chapter about how they're metabolized and how we get energy from uh, carbohydrates. Uh, but that's not all they do. Okay, uh, we have structural carbohydrates as well. So cellulose, shown here, we talked about that back in uh, 351. Uh, cellulose, uh, the main component of wood. Uh, we see that our DNA and our RNA strands have a carbohydrate portion. The backbone is formed by carbohydrates with phosphoester linkages uh, between them. And we see that uh, uh, regular organic molecules can actually have carbohydrate portions on them. Doxorubicin, uh, a very uh, common anti-cancer drug. Vancomycin has a carbohydrate portion to it. Uh, so carbohydrates are everywhere, right? Glucose is our most common one that we think of. But carbohydrates uh, make up approximately 50% of the world's biomass. So that would be the mass of all living organisms, all material that is produced by living organisms. Essentially, half of that 
is carbohydrates. Okay, so very, very important uh, in nature. Um, car we, we know carbohydrates as energy sources. They're actually not the most efficient energy sources. So if you look at the amount of energy you can get per gram from carbohydrates versus lipids, lipids are superior. You can get more energy per gram from lipids or fats than you can from carbohydrates. So why do you think carbohydrates are so important if they're not as efficient an energy source as lipids? What property do carbohydrates have that lipids do not? Any ideas? Yes. Exactly. They're water soluble. So whereas lipids are essentially con confined to our liver, um, they can be transported, but, but, they, but it's uh, more difficult to transport lipids throughout the body. Uh, carbohydrates being water soluble can be transported anywhere in the body. And so if we need energy in any sorts of tissues, uh, carbohydrates will be the immediate source uh, of energy. So it's their water solubility uh, that makes them the uh, very, very useful uh, sources of energy. So our simplest carbohydrates are known as monosaccharides. A monosaccharide is a single carbohydrate unit. Uh, glu glucose here is a monosaccharide, for example, uh, as opposed to a polysaccharide, which is composed of multiple uh, monosaccharides, multiple carbohydrates that can be cleaved into smaller groups. So cellulose would be a polysaccharide, glucose is a monosaccharide. Uh, and monosaccharides will have anywhere from three to seven carbons uh, in their chain. And they often form rings, as you see here uh, on the screen, okay? So the most common monosaccharides, I did say three to seven carbons, uh, but the most common ones uh, will have five or six carbons uh, in their chain. So here uh, we have glyceraldehyde, a simple monosaccharide, a three carbon monosaccharide, uh, and dihydroxyacetone, another three carbon monosaccharide. And we see some terms we need to learn, uh, aldose and ketose. So um, a carbohydrate that has an aldehyde will be called an aldose, and one that has a ketone will be called a ketose. Okay, very simple. Uh, and then we also use um, prefixes indicating how many carbons there are in the chain. Uh, so glyceraldehyde would be an aldotriose. Glucose would be an aldohexose. Fructose would be a ketohexose. Okay, so these are, these are some terms uh, they give you information about whether or not the carbohydrate has an aldehyde or a ketone and how many carbons there are in the chain. Uh, another feature of carbohydrates, uh, well, of the ketoses, the ketone is always at C2. So you'll see the way we've drawn these. It's kind of different from how we draw other molecules. More on that in a moment. But if it's an aldose, we're typically going to draw it with the aldehyde at the top and the carbon chain just in a vertical line. And then the groups on the sides coming off horizontally. Uh, and then if it's a ketose, that ketone is going to be at C2. It's that way in dihydroxyacetone and in fructose. Uh, and so you put that ketone as close to the top of the structure and the remainder of the chain coming off the bottom. And when you do that, the, the groups coming off the sides are going to be pointing up. The, the, the vertical bonds are going to be pointing back. Uh, at each of the carbons uh, that you see, okay? So this way of drawing our carbohydrates is related to something that is known as a Fisher projection. And we'll show you what a Fisher projection is and how to draw a molecule in a Fisher projection. So we're used to showing zigzag chains for, for chains that are in the plane of a board. We're used to showing wedges and dashes for groups that come out of the plane of the board. So here I'm going to draw for you D-glyceraldehyde. I'll explain where the D comes from in a moment. In a form that we would be used to seeing it. Okay, this is a, just a, a normal wedge and dash form. Okay. 
But to convert it into a Fischer projection, the first thing we need to do is draw it more like uh, glucose and fructose are drawn here on the board, or actually the way that, that glyceraldehyde is drawn here on the screen. Uh, and that is, we need to twist it around so that the aldehyde is at the top and the bond to the aldehyde is pointing back. And then the bond, the other vertical bond from, from C2 is also pointing back. And then the horizontal bonds are pointing out. I need to move that arrow. We'll move it over here. And if we do that, so we're going to have to rotate this so that this is pointing back. These two groups are going to come up. Hydrogen is going to be on the left. OH is going to be on the right. Okay. Any questions about how I got from this to that? Uh, and if this is a process that's challenging for you to see, uh, I would invite you to make molecular models and twist those molecular models around. Uh, that will help you uh, see how to do this. Okay. So to draw this molecule in a Fischer projection, we get rid of the wedges and dashes and we just make a cross. So at the intersection of the cross is a carbon. That's going to be C2 uh, of our glyceraldehyde. And then the vertical bonds in the cross are the ones that are pointing back. And the horizontal bonds in the cross are the ones that are pointing out. So this Fischer projection structure means this. And if we want to turn that into a, uh, a zigzag uh, chain sort of a structure, it would look like that. But all these are the same molecule. Uh, we need to be able to determine the configuration of the stereocenter. If we look at the stereo center, we've got one, two, three, but the hydrogen's pointing up, so that's going to be R. Okay, R stereo center on that uh, particular carbon. So your book shows you a sample problem of how to do this. Uh, basically, the same process that we just went over uh, on the board. Okay, and then. It also shows you a, uh, another sample problem uh, that's asking you how to determine R and S uh, from a Fisher projection. Okay, So these are some skills uh, that you'll need to, to practice uh, and become proficient with. Okay, any questions? All right, so um, one thing to note about Fisher projections is that the Fisher projection structure does not represent reality. Okay, uh, as we'll show you in a moment, when you draw a molecule in a Fisher projection, uh, you have a, a longer chain in a Fisher projection. Uh, you end up with eclipsing bonds, uh, and that's not very uh, favorable. Okay, but Fisher projections are useful for reasons that we'll explain in a moment, okay? So this is Fischer projections applied to simple carbohydrates, ones that just have three carbons. What about glucose, which has six carbons? How does that look in a Fischer projection, and what does that mean? Well, let's go ahead and get our eye clickers out. This is a Fischer projection of the structure of glucose, and we're asking you, go ahead and talk to your neighbors, how many stereocenters are present in glucose, okay? Spot the stereocenters.
Nice. No, it's not. You're correct. All right, let's get our final answers in. Any more answers coming in? Okay. All right, that looks like all of our answers for today. Okay, how many stereo centers? Four, yep. So C2, C3, C4, and C5 are all stereo centers in glucose, okay? Our aldehyde and our primary alcohol are not. So how many different stereoisomers are there of glucose? Two to the fourth, 16, 16 stereoisomers. So what you have is eight diastereomers total, and each of those diastereomers comes as a pair of enantiomers, okay? Uh, and we'll show you those structures in a minute. So let, let's go ahead and draw. So here I've drawn enantiomers in a Fisher projection for you. This is D-glyceraldehyde, which we had right here. This is L-glyceraldehyde. Uh, it's enantiomer. The D in the L nomenclature came from Emil Fisher, who was the father of carbohydrate chemistry, who came up with the Fisher projection. And so he just arbitrarily decided that the naturally occurring enantiomer of glyceraldehyde would be called D. This was long before R and S was, uh, was uh, introduced. And so the mirror image of the enantiomer is L. And the easy way to remember that with glyceraldehyde is when you draw the Fisher projection, the OH group is on the left in the L enantiomer. So that's very easy to memorize, okay? But glucose, this is referred to as D-glucose. It's got four stereocenters. How, how do we determine D and L for hexose is like glucose. Well, what we do is we look at the C5 stereocenter, the stereocenter that is the lowest uh, in the chain when you draw it in the Fisher projection. If the stereocenter that is at the bottom in the Fisher projection has the OH group pointing to the right, it is the D enantiomer. If that group is pointing to the left, it is the L enantiomer. So it's very simple. So we can draw Fisher projections for glucose here. And in glucose, when you draw the Fisher projection, the OH groups as you go down the chain have a right, left, right, right pattern. Okay, that's how you know it's glucose. It goes right, left, right, right. And then you can fill in the hydrogens, okay? So this is D-glucose. Let's raise that up a little bit so you can see a little bit better. And then if you want to draw L-glucose, you just mirror it. Okay, and we see that it's L because the C5 stereocenter has the OH group pointing to the left in the Fisher projection. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure why this is the case. It presumably has to do with how they are biosynthesized, uh, but all of the naturally occurring enantiomers of carbohydrates will be D. Okay, I'm sorry that that's backwards from proteins or, or amino acids, right? Amino acids, the naturally occurring ones were L. Uh, with carbohydrates, they are D. Um, and that's because that C5 stereocenter, the, 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 the stereocenter furthest down the chain, uh, has the OH group pointing to the right. Questions? All right, so let's look at some more complicated carbohydrates. Uh, before we do that, let's look at what a Fisher projection would look like if a carbohydrate such as glucose adopted a Fisher projection, it would curl on itself, kind of like curling around a cylinder. Hopefully by now, you know enough organic chemistry to look at that structure and realize that that's gonna be a really high energy conformation. You're gonna have a lot of steric hindrance. You're gonna have torsional strain because you're gonna have eclipsing bonds. It is not gonna adopt the Fisher projection. So if the Fisher projection does not represent the conformation that carbohydrates adopt, why do we use it? That's a great question. There is an answer to it though. Uh, and that is that in the Fisher projection, it is very easy to see the stereochemical relationships between different carbohydrates. 
If we draw two different carbohydrates in Fisher projections, we can easily see at which stereo centers their configurations are the same and at which stereo centers their configurations are different. So it's very good for that purpose. Uh, it's also very helpful for learning the names, associating the structures with the names. Uh, it's also very helpful in derivatives of carbohydrates of determining whether or not there are planes of symmetry. And we'll see how that is applied next week. So there are reasons for using Fisher projections. However, when we use them, we have to be very, very careful to recognize that uh, that is not the confirmation that the carbohydrate will be adopting. Okay? So with that said, let's look at a few more Fisher projections. We have uh, some, these are tetroses. Tetroses are, uh, they exist, but they're not super common in nature. But we see we have two stereocenters with tetroses. So we have four stereoisomers, uh, two diastereomers that exist as a pair of enantiomers. And we see that the D1s have the uh, OH at C3 to the right. The L1s have it to the left. And you don't have to memorize these names. Okay. The names you do have to memorize are on this slide, but don't worry, you don't have to memorize all of them. You only have to memorize a handful of the names on this slide, okay? So this slide is showing you all of the D enantiomers from C3 to C6, right? And the D ones are the ones that, that, that exist in nature, okay? Uh, so each of these D uh, sugars has a mirror image, which is going to be the L sugar, but since that uh, typically is not formed in nature, those are very rare in nature, we're not showing it to you on the slide. So the only ones you have to memorize are the ones that are important in nature, important in biochemistry. And of the pentoses, that's going to be ribose. Okay, so you should memorize the structure of ribose. And it is really easy because in ribose, all of the OH groups are on the right in the Fisher projection. So now you already know the structure of ribose, okay? Arabinose and xylose are also, they also exist in nature, but they're not as important as ribose, so we'll only make you memorize ribose, okay? The hexoses, uh, of which there are eight that are named, and each has an L enantiomer that has the same name, just an L in front of it instead of D. Uh, these are more common in nature, but only uh, three of them are important, okay? So glucose, of course, you have to memorize that one. I already told you that the OH groups go right, left, right, right when you draw the Fisher projection. The next one that you need to memorize is mannose. Mannose is also uh, prominent and important. Uh, and mannose is an epimer of glucose, okay? Epimer is a vocabulary word that you need to learn. An epimer is a diastereomer that differs only at a single stereocenter, okay? So when you have molecules with multiple stereocenters, and they're the same at every stereocenter except one, they are epimers of each other. So if we look here at the figure, and we look at mannose and glucose, uh, at which carbon are glucose and mannose epimers of each other? Remember the aldehyde is C1, C2, exactly. So mannose is simply the C2 epimer of glucose, right? So now you know the structure of mannose. And then the third one you need to know is galactose. If we compare glucose to galactose, you will see that they are C4 epimers. At C4, glucose's OH goes to the right, Galactose at C4, it goes to the left, okay? So now I've taught you the four uh, aldo, pentose, and hexoses that you need to know the structures, and you already know them, right? Ribose all to the right, glucose goes right, left, right, right, mannose is the C2 epimer of glucose, and galactose is the C4 epimer. So very easy to memorize the structures of uh, the carbohydrates that we need to learn, okay? Um, there is uh, another type of carbohydrate that's important, of course, the ketoses. These are all aldoses. On this slide, we see the ketoses from C3 through C6. And what we see with the ketoses 
is that they're a lot less on the slide. And that's because we have one less stereo center. Uh, because the carbonyl is at C2 instead of C1, C2 is not a stereo center in the ketosis. C1 is not a stereo center because that's a primary alcohol. Okay, so there's half as many uh, ketoses as there are hexoses. And fortunately for you, there's only one ketose uh, that is uh, important in nature, and that is fructose. Okay? Even more fortunately for you, fructose is identical to glucose in terms of the stereo centers that it has. Right? It does not have a C2 stereo center. The C3 stereo center is to the left. That's the same as glucose. Four and five are to the right. Okay? So very, very easy to learn. Okay? If you really want to, you could learn sickos. That's kind of a cool name for a, a sugar, but... Uh, uh, the, the only one that's important here is fructose. Any questions? When we go back to this slide, you can see that there's a pattern in terms of how the uh, carbohydrate structures are shown. Uh, if we look at our eight hexoses, of course, they're D, so all of them have the C5OH to the right. Uh, and then they're organized so that the C4OH, 4 to the right, 4 to the left, C3OH, 2 to the right, 2 to the left, 2 to the right, 2 to the left, and then at C2, they're alternating. And that's by design because it used to be, back when I took organic chemistry, you had to memorize all the names of the carbohydrates. Uh, and so you would draw them in this order, so they were always in the same order in every textbook, uh, so that you could come up with a mnemonic device for the names of those. Uh, and the textbook that I used uh, when I was a student, uh, the mnemonic device was all altruists gladly make gum in gallon tanks. So it's a useless bit of information, but uh, for some reason it has stuck with me uh, for more than 25 years now. Uh, so if you want to learn all the names, you're welcome to, uh, but you don't have to uh, do that. You only have to know glucose, mannose, and galactose. But let's talk about properties of carbohydrates. Uh, one property they're known for is their sweet taste. Now that varies. Some carbohydrates are sweeter than others, but they do have uh, a sweet taste. Uh, what about their solubility properties? Will carbohydrates be water soluble? Most definitely. If you've ever dissolved sugar in water, you're aware uh, that they are water soluble. Okay. Uh, in fact, they are the rare class of organic uh, compounds that are mostly insoluble in organic solvents. They're so polar, they're much more polar than uh, typical organic solvents, so they actually do not dissolve well in ether. They don't dissolve at all in ether, uh, for example. So uh, we mentioned to you that carbohydrates, uh, they're not going to form the Fischer projection, in fact, in nature, they tend to not exist as open chains. They tend to form rings, okay? Uh, and the rings that they tend to form are known as cyclic hemiacetals. This is something we learned briefly in chapter 21. Uh, we learned about hemiacetals. We learned about acetals in chapter 21. Uh, and an acetal uh, is a, um, an acetal has two ethers on the same carbon. And we, we use those as protecting groups for aldehydes and ketones. Uh, and an intermediate in forming an acetal was the hemiacetal or half of an acetal, which has a, an ether and an OH group on the same carbon. Okay. So what happens with carbohydrates, they'll have an OH group at one end. They'll have an aldehyde at the other end or a ketone close to the other end. Okay. And what happens is the OH group is going to cyclize onto the, the aldehyde. I'm not showing the entire mechanism here. Uh, the mechanism uh, involves acid or base. You can draw a mechanism using either acid or base. If you're using acid, you protonate the carbonyl first. If you're using base, you deprotonate the OH group first. 
And in neutral water, there's a high enough concentration of H3O plus and OH minus to allow this process to happen. Okay, so you can, you can draw it either way. So I'm not showing you the mechanism. I'm just showing you uh, in general what's happening. The alcohol acting as a nucleophile, attacking the uh, carbonyl carbon. Then we're going to have a proton transfer. We're going to deprotonate here, protonate there. One of those is already done before the reaction occurs. Um, so we're going to end up with a carbon that used to be a carbonyl carbon that is now what's known as a hemiacetal, right? And it's also a stereocenter. I've drawn this really funny. I've kind of drawn these flat structures. Uh, this is a traditional way of drawing carbohydrates. We'll explain why carbohydrates are drawn like this uh, momentarily. Um, of course, we know that six-membered rings are going to form chairs as opposed to uh, flat structures. Uh, but some vocabulary we need to learn. The hemiacetal carbon that used to be the carbonyl carbon is known as the anomeric carbon. Okay. The anomeric carbon is a stereocenter. So for each carbohydrate you see in this uh, table here, uh, when it cyclizes to form a cyclic hemiacetal, it's going to have diastereomers, okay, that are actually epimers, right, because they only differ at one stereocenter. Those epimers are referred to as anomers, okay. So anomers are carbohydrates that are epimeric only at the anomeric carbon. Anomers, anomeric carbon. These are some terms we need to learn. A couple more terms that we need to learn is that a furanose is a five-membered cyclic hemiacetal, and a pyranose is a six-membered cyclic hemiacetal, okay? So furanose and pyranose, sorry, I forgot the E on pyranose. Uh, these are terms that refer to five-membered cyclic ether, so furan is a five-membered cyclic ether. Pyran is a six-membered cyclic ether. That's why we have these terms, uh, furanose and pyranose. Okay? So these cyclic hemiacetals are the confirmations that these carbohydrates are primarily going to be involved in, uh, in nature. How do we convert a Fischer projection into a cyclic hemiacetal? We will show you how this is done with glucose, okay? So first we're gonna draw glucose in the Fischer projection. And we know our OH groups go right, left, right, right. And we draw in our hydrogens. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to rotate 90 degrees clockwise about C5. Okay, 90 degrees clockwise at C5. We need to put this OH, this is the OH that's going to be used to make our pyranose, our six-membered ring. One, two, three, four, five, six. We could use the alcohol at the end, but that would make a seven-membered ring. That's going to have strain. The five and the six-membered rings are going to be more prominent. And specifically, the six-membered rings are the most common cyclic hemiacetals that we see. Okay, so in order to see how this is going to look in its cyclic form, we need to rotate at C5 to get that OH pointing down. That's going to move the primary alcohol over here. I need to shorten that arrow I made. And that's going to put the hydrogen over there. And the other three are going to look just the same. Right, left, right, in terms of the patterns of our OH groups. Okay, Does everybody see how I just rotated at C5? Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to lay our Fischer projection on its side. Meaning we're just going to take the whole thing and rotate it 90 degrees. So I'm going to draw the OH here. And then we're going to draw 
Let me make sure I get this right. Okay. So this is carbon five, four, three, two, one. So I've got all my carbons in the chain. And then we have the groups. So because we rotated it on its side clockwise, the groups that are on the left are now gonna be pointing up in this particular structure. Let me fix this so it looks a little bit better. There, that looks better. Okay. So the primary alcohol is pointing up. Hydrogen is down. At this carbon, we have a hydrogen pointing up, OH down. This carbon is here, OH is up, hydrogen is down. And then this carbon is here, OH down, hydrogen up. Okay, everybody see how we got that? All right, now that we've got it laying on its side, now we cyclize. And again, we're not drawing the mechanism. We would either protonate the carbonyl or deprotonate the OH first. Uh, but ultimately, the, uh, the OH is going to attack our carbonyl, and we're going to end up with our cyclic hemiacetals as a mixture of anomers, because we'll have different stereochemistry at the anomeric carbon. Um, we're drawing these flat. We know they're not flat. What shape are these six-membered rings actually going to be in? They're going to be in the chair. Uh, but we draw them flat because they were traditionally drawn flat long before it was known that six-membered rings adopted chair conformations. Okay? So we're going to have a mixture of anomers. We'll have one in which our OH group is pointing down. And then we'll have another in which our OH group at the anomeric carbon is pointing up. Okay. But all the other carbons are going to have the same stereochemistry. Okay. So we have to have a way to distinguish our anomers this anomer I've shown on the left is the alpha anomer. So we would call that alpha D-glucopyranose. Pyranose indicating it's in the six-membered ring. Sometimes we would just say alpha D-glucose. That's kind of shorthand. Uh, but this is known as the alpha anomer. And this one is known as the beta anomer. Beta D-glucopyranose. So how do we know it's alpha or beta? We look at the relationship between the OH group at the anomeric carbon and the primary alcohol. This primary alcohol in D sugars will be pointing up. If the anomeric OH is trans, it is alpha. Okay, So a trans relationship between the anomeric OH and the primary alcohol means alpha. So with D sugars, Alpha will always be pointing down. And beta will always be pointing up. Beta indicates a cis relationship between the anomeric OH and that primary alcohol. Any questions? All right, we'll stop there. We'll see you on Monday. Please remember to bring your synthesis assignments.